E quanto è grande? Ha un aspect ratio maggiore di 50 cm? Quanto è? No, minuscolo. Sì, piccolo. La, le, le grandezze. Quanto è grande? No, eh, ti dico. No, sì, secondo me perché non ho capito. No, dice no, no, no. Ok. Um, let's start. We are just a handful today, so um, I hope it's not because of me or my way of lecture or because I scared you so much last time. Um, so we should get through the lecture today. So um, I hope... I've told you something about the principal concept, the first lecture, then I went into, I demonstrated to you that in current experiments, it's possible to achieve what one expects for a machine like Demo. Then I told you that all this physics is very complex. And so we need a numerical model that tries to uh, describe the physics processes in an as complete as possible way. I introduced to you what the fluid transport equations are. This is the main workhorse for interpreting experimental data. And I was just about to introduce you or introduce you to the uh, other part of the code. That's the neutral transport codes. That usually a Monte Carlo based code, um, but of course, there is a penalty to pay, which is speed. And so there are three prominent examples of this uh, neutral transport codes. Uh, there's Arena that was developed in Jülich. There's Dega, uh, which is an American code. And there's uh, NUT2D, which is a Japanese code, uh, probably the most advanced and most complete is Arena. Uh, it's named after the Greek goddess of peace. So, um, so the single letters have no, no particular meaning. And essentially it, it emulates or simulates a Markov chain of processes for following neutrals, but IRENA is also capable of, in principle, following any, um, any type of particle that has to undergo a Markov chain. You could rewrite the code to do something else. And in fact, the code is also able, I told you something about the Lyman alpha uh, opacity, yeah, where a Lyman alpha photon is emitted and if the density of neutrals is very high, it gets reabsorbed. And Irina in a PhD thesis had been extended to be able to simulate what we call photon transport. So in this case, instead of a neutral particle, a photon is followed and uh, one can try to better estimate uh, the effects of the opacity on the plasma solution. So what does this look like uh, in, in, a, in a model when we talk of a, a kinetic Monte Carlo uh, trajectory? Forget about here the, the color coding. This is just to show you that this is a cross section of our six upgrade. It's a very old simulation of mine from I don't know, probably 15, 20 years ago. So uh, you can see here the trajectories of the neutrals and you can see here the grid of the fluid code. And what you can obviously see is that the density of trajectories at the, in the divert is very high, as is in this region that we call the subdiverter volume. And down here, these straight lines is the area where the pump is. And you can see that some trajectories end here in the, in the grid, which means the neutral particle has been ionized. And the moment it is ionized, the code restarts a new particle and follows it until it's either ionized or being pumped away by the pump. So it ends its lifetime, yeah? And what happens when it's ionized? Well, then it's an ionization source and you can use two different types of uh, estimators to estimate the volumetric sources. So you extrapolate them. So in reality, let's say in the experiments, you have, let's say a particle flux of 10 to the 22 per square meter and second to the target. Of course, the neutral 
Monte Carlo code will not start ten to the two yeah. yeah. particles. Yeah, it would take ages to follow these. So it only starts um, a subset of particles, which it tries to distribute according to the influx of the plasma to the target. Arena takes care of the plasma wall interaction, so it has some model of with what energy the particle needs to start. There are some assumptions with, at which angle it starts from the surface. So what type of cosine distribution it does or cosine square distribution it does. If it's a thermal particle, if it's a molecule that starts or if it's an impurity that has been sputtered uh, by the impact of the plasma onto the target. Yeah. So in this case, it would start in neutral impurity if the user cares about following this impurity. Yeah? The user may also decide that this following of this type of neutral is irrelevant and therefore we don't do this. So, <clears throat> um, so the code starts about, let's say on ASICS upgrade, we launch about 40 to 100,000 uh, test particles and each test particle so if you have a neutral, this neutral that flies through the grid represents all types of excited states of the neutral. Yeah? Not just the ground state, but any, any excited state. So at the end of the day, when you do your sampling, <coughs> you can say, okay, so and so many neutrals of these under certain assumptions are in an excited state. And from this, for example, you can calculate what the Balma radiation in a uh, cell would be. It's a representative particle that we say, well, it represents a train of particles. Yeah? Okay, so um, maybe as an add-on, so um, you could also do uh, an effect for large devices like Pema and Eta. Often preliminary simulations are done using a fluid description of neutrals. Why? Because uh, the plasma is so dense in the diverter that the kinetic collisions are so many that it's actually rather wise inside the, let's say, fluid domain to describe the, the, um, the, the neutral as a fluid because of the large magnitude of collisions. However, uh, where you where you don't have so many collisions, you need to have a kinetic treatment. And so while for a fluid, often you have a 2D description, it's much faster. Yeah, we're talking about orders of magnitudes uh, faster in speed. Um, it can have a satisfactory, let's say, agreement upstream because there the neutrals don't play much of a role. But in the diverter, often the final solutions are not equivalent to the kinetic solutions when, um, when one is aiming for accuracy. And so what is done these days, there's a group in, uh, at the University of Leuven, they are specialized on computational methods and improvements. And so they have gotten very far with a, what we would call a hybrid model between a fluid and a kinetic. So, They've done the proof of principle that this works in a slab geometry. And now we are trying also at my lab to apply their code or their code version to our experiments and try to compare between kinetic and fluid simulations. And then at some point, the group from uh, Giuseppe will apply this to demo sites scale devices uh, if we say that this worked out. Yeah? But this to show you that this is type of active research. Things are not complete, even though I showed you a graph of 20 years ago. So. Okay, how is the modeler in our area of research usually for the script of layers setting up such a code? Just to show you that there are many things that come in. And uh, first of all, you have the magnetic equilibrium. And then there are several uh, numerical code packages that out of this produce a grid. So Carré is a grid generating uh, tool. And you produce input files for ARENA and for the fluid neutral part. And then 
uh, once you've run the code, you have further software, uh, so you can store the results into an MDS database so that it's accessible for everybody. It's uh, allocated like a, a number. And so any person can access, uh, if, if the person knows how to read these data and what they mean, you can access these data through the plots. And then there's a plotting routine to plot and, and furthermore nowadays with the rise of Python as a, a programming language or interpretive programming language, uh, a lot of Python tools have been developed. Unfortunately, there's not necessarily synchronization among the different groups, what tools they have, even though each time we have a PhD student or a postdoc, we try to do this, but uh, this is never really completed, unfortunately. Okay, so it's a whole set and uh, using such numerical codes is a very intense way of getting an overview of all the uh, physics that's relevant for the scrapbook layer because you're in touch with all of it because you need to consciously think about is this assumption correct or is this a wrong assumption. You make a lot of assumptions when you apply these codes and so you need to be aware what the simplification is that you're using and what's the physics behind? Why are you making a certain assumption? And this is a little bit shown here. So of course, any model has tons of free parameters and you could argue that, well, it's just a question of choosing the right parameters and the model will match the experimental data. Yeah? And so you will have a good interpretation of your experimental data. But this is not so true because each boundary condition and each parameter has a physics motivation. Yeah? So you need to think if your assumption is actually valid. So is this a good assumption or a bad assumption? So for example, if you have, if the walls of the machines were made of graphite, you would have physical sputtering and you would have another sputtering process that maybe Sebastian talked about, but I didn't which is chemical sputtering, which is based on the fact that a hydrogenic isotope can undergo a chemical process with the element because carbon and hydrogen can chemically react. Yeah? While this is less of an issue with tungsten, in theory, there is a chemical reaction. It is detectable, but it's essentially irrelevant for our um, understanding you know, the error one makes by not taking into account chemical reactions is essentially relevant. But if you had chemical reactions, which is important, for example, for a machine like TCD in Switzerland or D3D in San Diego or um, mass upgrade in the United Kingdom, then you need to make some assumption on the chemical erosion. And this may not be trivial. So for the outer target where the target is very hot, you may be able to look up some uh, scaling formulas that have been developed in the past, especially when ITER was still uh, considering to have uh, carbon targets. But for the inner diverter, where you may have areas where material is redeposited and when carbon is redeposited, it forms amorphous hydrocarbon layers. So there is chemically bound hydrogen in between the uh, carbon atoms. And so it's a, it's, a, it's an amorphous structure and uh, there the chemical sputtering yield may not be what you expect. Plus these layers may flake off due to heat loads and so on. And the net effect, you need to somehow consider this in the code. And so you have a parameter that you may need to vary yeah, as soon as you have a carbon target. Then you may ask yourself, okay, um, what's the percentage of helium in the plasma? Do I need to include this? So if you simulate a reactor, you may want to include this. If you simulate a facility of present days, unless nobody's putting helium, you don't need to uh, take this into account. I come to drifts in a moment. <clears throat> then uh, you can debate about the conduction here. So you, you see here this simple, cut design where you see the inner outer target and this dome. And below this, often when you go to the drawing office, now you get this cross section of the machine. And down here, often it looks very empty. Yeah? But if you 
if you as a human being go into the machine and look into these regions below the dome and below the outer diverter, this is not an empty space. There are support structures, there are cables, there are diagnostics, and all these, they reduce the, um, they reduce the mean free path of a neutral that is flying down here. And so uh, the uh, neutral conductances are not what you would expect if you don't include them. And so we put a lot of effort on a six upgrade because we have a lot of uh, ionization pressure gauge measurements. These are tiny little boxes. They have a little uh, filament. This filament, uh, you can heat it up. It emits electrons. The electrons are accelerated by a grid on the on the way they can ionize the gas that's in this box. And then you can collect the electron current and the ion current and from its ratio, calibrating it with a proper uh, baritone pressure measurement, you can do, um, uh, you can measure um, the, the, the pressure even in the presence of a magnetic field to a high precision in the range of, let's say, one to eight Pascal, these uh, pressure measurements work. And we have a dozen of these uh, pressure gauges in the device. And so you can identify what the loss of neutral pressure is, let's say, between the dome and here the pumping chamber. And we know this varies, and it varies as a function of the neutral pressure. What does this tell us? That the neutral conductivity changes as a function of neutral pressure. And what can be the reason? The cables don't change, the, the structures don't change, but how can it be that the neutral pressure changes? How can the ratio of neutral pressure change between here and here from, let's say, a factor seven to a factor four, so by a factor two? Any idea what could play a role? Your engineers, that's your area. <laughs> Again. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you it's a function of pressure. So what happens when you have, let's say you have neutrals going through a pipe. Does it matter at what pressure the, the gas flow is going through the pipe to calculate the neutral conductance of the pipe? Yes or no? Let's imagine the pressure is very, very low. You put the pipe in outer space. Then how can you describe the neutrals? Can you, are you allowed to describe them as a kinetic process or so single particle just bouncing back and forth through the pipe? I guess so, no, because it's empty space. There's a neutral coming every time a pope is elected. So it's, there's no issue with that. You can do a kinetic treatment. But if you increase the pressure, what can happen? Come on, can't be so difficult. Have you ever experienced wind in your face or something? So neutrals, when you, the pressure is high enough, they can of course interact with each other. They collide with each other. It's the nature of this gas that neutrals collide with each other, no? So in this case, neutral neutral interactions are important and they change the flow of the gas through the pipe and so they change the conduction and the measure of the role or the importance of the neutral neutral collisions in the gas flow is the Knudsen number so as soon as the so-called Knudsen number goes up yeah then uh, you need to consider neutral neutral collisions these numerical codes can consider neutral neutral collisions. We can take this into account, but we don't do this often because it's computationally expensive. So what we do instead is we emulate the neutral conductance by, for example, changing the length of this little line here because it changes the gap for the neutrals below. And by changing the gap, we are changing the conductance of the neutrals. Yeah? And so we emulate this, the, the symptomatic effect of neutral neutral collisions without taking them into account because they, for the rest of our thing, don't play role. 
Okay, and then of course you can make some assumptions on the pumping efficiency of the pump. This picture here just shows you all, every of these little red Santa Claus houses. They are the position of one of these ionization pressure measurements. And so a six upgrade has a unique capability to poloidally measure the neutral pressure variations because during a discharge, pressure gauges that are, for example, here, is my mouth here below at the inner heat shield is the inner heat shield measure different pressures than pressure gauges that are here because in between these two there's plasma yeah? and of course they measure different pressures here so this was for us a very very important tool that unfortunately is missing on jet to validate our numerical codes i'll come to this so let's skip this so um how do we now constrain these codes? Yeah, how do we constrain the result? Well, first of all, the user needs to make a choice. Does he want to model a specific discharge in all its glory detail to a high precision? Yeah. Or does he or she uh, decide to model the trend of a discharge or a series of discharges? So to look if I change the heating power, if I change the fueling, if I change the impurity seeding, how does the plasma evolve in the experiment? And can my model reproduce this evolution? And am I happy with the degree at which it does it? Yeah. So talking about a good and a bad simulation is also a function of what are you expecting? Because it depends on how much can you restrict your assumptions? Yeah. So, and then the question is, what type of uh, experimental data do you have to constrain your code? So upstream, you have usually one dimensional profiles. These are radial profiles of electron temperature, maybe ion temperature of, for example, the flow velocity of the plasma or the radioelectric field. I can tell you it's easy for us to, well, easy, I mean, we are, quite proficient these days to match our uh, numerical codes to the electron density, the temperature and the ion temperature. But the flow velocity in the scrape of layer is one of the open questions that we have left apart because we are unable to match these because apparently the codes that we have seem to be incomplete to take into account all of the effects that lead to plasma flow in the scrape of layer. Then you have the targets, the inner target and the outer target. Some people decide to just model one target, neglect the outer target, and maybe the two targets depend on each other. Yeah? So you may find a good result for one target, have a complete mismatch at the other target, and then maybe you find a nice answer, but for the wrong reasons, because you have mismatched the other target. And you can compare to the pressure gauges. The more experimental data you take into account, the more difficult it gets. And I personally like to say that validating codes or comparing or benchmarking the codes, the, there are two schools, what is the better word for this, to, ex, to experimental data is a painful and tedious thing to do. It's much more easy to say, okay, I have some future machine and I will model this because it takes 10 years before you'll get the experimental data with which to compare these. And by then your career has moved on and you may be doing something completely different. And so who cares what you did said 10 years ago? Yeah? But doing the uh, validation process is one of the things that's really painful. And uh, we, we have put a lot of effort in the last years to do this in order to understand if the codes are actually capable of catching the key features, and I'll show you what we did in the past. But to give you an example, when your data are maybe not so um, sufficiently profound, think of the target heat flux as an as a experimental measurement with which you want to validate. So um, the target heat flux is essentially proportional to the density of the target times the temperature at the target, okay? But this is essentially also independent of the upstream density. So if you make a mistake upstream in the density profile, you will not 
you will not see an effect if the only information at the target you have, for example, an infrared measurement, because what you're comparing is unsensitive to your wrong assumption or to the potential error you made in the upstream assumption. However, if furthermore, as a further diagnostic, you had the JSAT is the ion saturation current. This is a measure for the particle flux to the target, measured by so-called Langmi probes. This, on the other hand, is proportional to this product here, which at the end of the day is proportional to the square of the upstream density. So if you mismatch the upstream density, even by a small factor, your mismatch at the target for the ion flux that you simulate compared to what you measure in the experiment can be very, very large. The error can be very large, despite matching the heat flux. Yeah. And so it depends a lot on what type of data you select to compare. Sometimes when you look into publications, you they write, oh, we had a fantastic match and they only plot the heat flux. Yeah. And it's very hard to judge, is this really a fantastic match? But on the other hand, maybe it is a fantastic match for the purpose of the simulation. Yeah? Because the simulation was looking at a very specific question, was trying to test something. So this is why I would say up to now for constraining codes, there's no, let's say, no real guidance in the sense of a rule book. Yeah? So you can only claim you matched your results well if these and these data are inside 5% error. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Nobody has ever written up something like this. Um, so of course, the more constraints, the merrier. So, um, but what I just said opens always up the question, which is the most relevant diagnostic to compare with? Uh, which, which is the information that's more relevant. Often it's a question of um, what is available as a diagnostic. Yeah. Sometimes we are very blind. Then there's one more thing that um, I, I didn't talk about. The parallel particle physics or the parallel transport physics is, let's say, relatively well known. There are some assumptions in this. I told you about the closure of the heat flux. Yeah, there's some assumption if the conduction limited regime is, or the, con the conducted heat flux is a proper way to do this. For most cases, it is, but there are some cases where it's not valid to use the assumptions that are in these codes. But let's assume you restrict your code to the area where this is a good assumption. I told you in the first lecture that perpendicular transport is often of turbulent nature. How do you describe turbulence in a transport code? This is not trivial, and I personally think this is the big open question that we have in the codes. I think when we look at how we restrict the code assumption, so all these assumptions that we can make, Everything is, I think nowadays, relatively well known. There's very little margin of what you can assume. But the biggest, the biggest assumption or the biggest freedom that you have is up here on the top right. It's the assumption on what is the nature of the public transport and how strong is it. Yeah. And this is essentially not known. And we describe this in the code by a perpendicular particle flux that's a collinear um, sum of a diffusive transport that's a function of a gradient and a convective transport or advective transport that's proportional to the density. Numerically, modeling a convective or advective transport is very, very difficult because it's numerically very unstable to do this. Yeah? Modeling advective processes is numerically much more difficult to attack. This is why usually we model uh, perpendicular particle transport by pure diffusion. Thereby we use a diffusion coefficient that's often radially dependent. And this is a guess we make. 
Yeah, and the procedure is often that we try to make a guess of these diffusion transport coefficients, as we call them, by fitting our transport coefficients such that we match the experimental upstream profiles. Why do we do this for the upstream profiles? Because I told you uh, in the two-point model, you remember uh, a lot was very sensitive, for example, to the upstream density, to the fall off length of the heat flux. And so if we say that this sets what the diverter will be in which condition it will be, this is why often this philosophy is used to match the upstream profile. Now, if we think of, is this wise to use a diffusive model or a convective model? Well, you can, you can just make a back of the envelope exercise and you can say, okay, the only thing the code wants to know from me is what is the particle flux in the perpendicular direction? And let's assume it is, I make an assumption, it's either completely diffusive or completely effective, this part being transport. And assuming that the density profile is in a, follows an exponential decay, then I can uh, make these particle fluxes equal and I can show that you can describe any convective flux by such uh, uh, assumption or translation into diffusive coefficient. Uh, so it doesn't matter. As long as you're only interested in the perpendicular flux and not in the sensitivity, how it may change as a function of density or the gradient, but for a fixed gradient and density, then it doesn't matter if you have described it as a diffusive flux or a convective flux. And it doesn't matter in this context anyways, because you don't know any about anything about the nature of the transport itself. So how turbulent it is, what governs the turbulent. As long as you have no description for this, it, in these types of codes, it doesn't matter. Of course, several people are working on introducing such a description of the nature of the perpendicular transport into the codes itself, because it may depend on gradient or density or recycling. And so to have a more self-consistent way, because what do you do when you don't have upstream profiles? Let's say you want to predict the machine. How do you deal with this? We can't, yeah? we can't really do this. We need to make some assumptions of what we would assume how the profiles may look like in future devices. The only tool we have at the moment where we think this is relatively reliable, but we can again debate about this, is this lambda Q scaling that I showed to you at the beginning, yeah, this uh, experimental scaling for attached conditions. But we do not know if in detached conditions this is still valid. Yeah. So um, now this was all simple physics. We can make our life more difficult and we need to make it more difficult because there is a process called drifts in plasmas and this makes the numerics more difficult and also the understanding more difficult. So if we look at the inner and the outer target, there are various reasons why, even if the feed lines, well, there are various reasons why the heat flux and the conditions in the two targets are not the same. Yeah, you could argue, well, it should be split between the two, no? And they should be the same. It's maybe a symmetric problem. Well, the first one is there's a Grad-Shafranov shift, which means that if you, uh, assume a constant gradient or a gradient among flux surfaces, yeah? then the flux surfaces on the low field side, so this outer side, are more compressed than on the inside. And so the gradient is different. And so you get, if you assume a fixed um, diffusive coefficient, you get more particle flux on the low field side than on the high field side, just from pure considerations because the great, because, why is this? Because you assume that the density is roughly constant on a flux surface, yeah? But because the flux surfaces are closer to each other, the gradient of the density from one flux surface to the next is steeper. 
And so if the particle flux, the perpendicular one is D times the gradient of the density, then just because of this, a code will produce more particle outflux in the low field side compared to the high field side. And then you often have uh, here on the low field side, just the surface area is larger. Yeah? So the integral is larger. And then uh, there is often also the assumption of ballooning. Ballooning is a phenomenon in transport in tokamaks, which favors transport on the low field side. Yeah? So turbulent transport tends to be larger on the low field side compared to the high field side. And this ballooning effect is often taken into these codes as a, as a scaling property yeah? with some exponent where you say, okay, as a function of one over magnetic field or magnetic field squared, your transport coefficient varies. Yeah? So you take into account this type of ballooning. But there are further things that can drive asymmetries in tokamaks, and these are drifts. So there are various drifts. Let's say the, the two most prominent ones that affect the uh, diverter conditions mostly are um, the poloidal E cross B drift and the radial E cross B drift. So the poloidal flow that is depicted here in red is driven by a radial electric field cross B, you know, ER cross B. And the um, perpendicular uh, flow that you see here with these little green arrows, that's driven by a poloidal temperature gradient. And now the question is, where does this poloidal temperature gradient come from? Well, once we cool the plasma, for example, with seed impurities, you produce a temperature gradient down here in the diverter, and this poloidal temperature gradient, so a gradient of temperature between, let's say, this location and this location here, causes a transport perpendicular. Yeah? So it moves particles from here to here, and then there's this poloidal flow that moves the particles over here, and then it moves particles across here. Yeah? And this causes that the density due to drifts is reduced in the outer target compared to what you would not expect without drifts and increased in the inner target compared to what you would expect without drifts. And this causes an asymmetry because a low density outer target because of pressure balance will have a hotter target in very simple words and the inner target will be colder. So the outer target, the inner target being colder, more volumetric processes will start, which then help to cool the plasma further, while at the outer target, this may be not achieved so easily. And this is, all these factors are the reason why it's always more difficult to detach the outer target compared to the inner target. And this is the reason why everybody usually focuses on the conditions at the outer target, because the inner target sort of mostly will do the work itself somehow, but the outer target is the critical one. That's why when one talks about heat loads and so on, or erosion, it's always checking if the outer target is doing okay. Okay, but if these numerical models include drifts, I won't go through the entire slide, but just to look at this box, these numerical codes, they run with a specific time step. So an evolution in time. And let's say on a small machine like TCD, you can run at 10 to the minus four seconds for a time step. So if you need one second of real time to equilibrate the plasma conditions, you have to run 10,000 time steps or so. This is relatively fast. Yeah. It's done in a day or a few days. So here it's about for TCV, this means to reach conversion, it takes you about one day without trips to, if you change some parameter, restart the run, the next day you can come back, look at your laptop, and you have a result that's okay in terms of convergence. You may let it run a little bit longer to be well converged, but you can guess the result already after that. But if you run with all the drifts, then the time step needs to be reduced by a factor 100 or 1000. And this means that in order to reach convergence, it may take you months. Yeah? 100 days is about three months. Yeah, instead of a day. 
So you can't do all these parameter scans that you may be able to do without drifts. So the philosophy often is, if you want to check what phenomena may be really important or not, you do this without activating drifts. But if you want to compare to real experimental data, once you have understood where the code is more or less sensitive, you start selecting few conditions which you run with drifts. And all this makes these types of work very time consuming. Yeah? For a machine like ETA, running with full drifts takes you a year. Okay, so uh, of course we have done simulations with drifts and this is just a graphical picture of a PhD thesis that I supervised where the um, candidate Felix, uh, he now works in Greifswald, has been analyzing what the role of the drifts is on the different particle fluxes. And you can see you get with all these arrows pointing in all sorts of directions with the different colors depicting the different type of drifts. So diamagnetic drifts, per Schlüter. I haven't even mentioned these. Um, leads to a very complex picture. But then one can also try to look at, well, what's the overall effect of drift? So if you look, for example, in L mode, so low confinement mode, where actually drifts are less, have less of an impact, roughly, um, you, you um, well, they have less of an impact, by the way, because the gradients are flatter. Yeah, the radial gradient of an L mode is flatter. And because the upstream plasma is less hot than an H mode, the parallel gradient or poloidal gradient is also shallower. And so the, the, the drift flow is lower. So uh, for the inner target, yeah, you get as you can see an asymmetry between drifts and no drifts if you compare to the outer target. But at the outer target, you get very similar results for the integral particle flux running without drifts or with drifts. Well, for the inner target, you get more of a discrepancy between the two. And this way you can check, well, when is it valid maybe, or when is it acceptable to not run with drifts and when is it not? So model validation, um, I'll talk for another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have a break. So this is, um, <clears throat> This, these plots are based on the uh, uh, work of a master thesis from last year, no, two years ago, actually, in our lab. He's now a PhD student with us. So uh, what you see here on the left are data from temperature measurements using a Thomson scattering system on R6 upgrade for the upstream location. And on the right side, uh, the profile, the data here, the circular things, for the density profile from a diagnostic called integrated data analysis. So integrated data analysis means several diagnostics have been put together and based on Bayesian probability theory, the most likely put profile or data points have been uh, computed. Yeah? And uh, one of the backbones of this uh, integrated data analysis diagnostic is a lithium beam diagnostic. So one injects a lithium beam into the plasma, the lithium gets uh, excited, emits light. And by looking at line ratios of the lithium lines, you can understand what the density is. And so uh, this is the backbone of it, but there are other diagnostics involved as well. So you can see here, that the data scatter and an exponential fit to these data has been done using this blue curve. And then here, um, the red line is the exponential fit to the um, data from IDA. Now, as I said, the numerical uh, particle flux in the perpendicular direction is this um, linear combination of a diffusive and a conductive flux. We have only assumed in this case a diffusive flux and the heat flux is a linear combination of a diffusive ion heat flux, a diffusive electron heat flux, both as function of gradient of the temperature and a convective heat flux that's a consequence of the diffusive particle flux. And so the diffusive particle flux, because you get a flux leads to a convective heat flux. And these charge exchange processes that I mentioned 
right? So this is the assumption that we do in the code. And what has the person now done? So this, this by the way, looks very nice. Um, you see here, this is at the function, as, this is a function of major radius. Yeah? So this is a radial position. But now the question is, so you see here the vertical arrow bars, but there's a further problem here that's not really um, accentuated in this figure. You, you remember I told you we have a magnetic equilibrium and we make our grid out of this magnetic equilibrium. And so you know where the separatrix is. The question is, do we know where the separatrix is? Because this assumes that our magnetic reconstruction is 100% sure. There is no error, but this is not true. Our magnetic reconstruction also has an error. And this means that the position of the separatrix is not known to infinitesimal precision. At the separatrix, the position of the separatrix, uh, at the outer midplane, sorry, the position of the separatrix on our six up grid is known relative to the known position of the diagnostics, because even the position of the diagnostic, so that measurement has an uncertainty. So if you take these and combine these uncertainties, you come up that the relative position of the diagnostic to the magnetic equilibrium is of the order of half a centimeter error. Now let's assume we are thinking that the separatrix is somewhere here. What does half a centimeter mean? So this is 2.14. So half a centimeter is something like half the distance between two ticks. If we now look here, let's assume we would guess the separatrix position is here, but it could also be here. What does this mean? That you have an error bar here for the density measurement, but you have also an error in the density assumption due to the uncertainty in the separatrix position, which is 20% or so of the density value. And now you remember the diverter conditions, they are a strong function of the upstream density. And so by not knowing where the separatrix really is, you already bring in an uncertainty of 20% on the upstream density that translates into a 50% uncertainty just because of this uncertainty into the expected particle flux that you will be simulating. So this is a problem and at the same time, you do not know what the relative position is of the temperature profiles because they are different diagnostics. They will have um, a different positioning to each other. So it's an uncertainty here. And so what the person did is he made an iterative process fitting the simulation profiles and the assumed transport coefficients to the density and the temperature profile simultaneously and trying to find which is the most consistent solution between the two. So he set up an automated process of a pure deuterium plasma and did dozens of runs that automatically readjusted the transport coefficients and the assumptions on the uh, density of the subtractrix. And then you find out that there is some uh, cross section here with my mouse which says, okay, at the density of 0.78, let's say, and the temperature of 65 EV, this is where you find the optimal solution between the two. And so this is the place which has the most consistent value for um, temperature and density at the same time, because that's consistent with uh, the, this type of profiles. And then you come up with this simulated profile here in blue, and the position of the subtractions. Yeah. So this is how this was done. So this is possible as long as you run without drifts. Uh, with drifts, each simulation would take you a factor 100 longer. And so it would take ages to do this. So we have no method to apply this uh, with drifts effects. OK, I think I explained. This is just a summary slide for the drift, so let's forget about this. So um, now we, I, I show you some results of um, what has been done in the modeling in the past to validate or to, to see do our codes match the experimental observations. 
So I told you that one of the big unknowns is the perpendicular transport. And there have been measure, many measurements in the past. And unfortunately, these measurements, while in theory, they could possibly provide us with a value for the perpendicular flux, they often can't really provide this because there are several assumptions that are too uh, unsure to actually provide a real hard number for gamma perp. Uh, if the experimentalist could provide to the simulation guy, gamma perp is equal to some number, then instead of assuming a D, a diffusive coefficient, you could just stick in this number into the code and let it run because you'd say, okay, the perpendicular particle X is given by the experimental data, but it's not the case. But what we do know is how, for example, the density decay length, so if you look back, so something like this, the decay length of this, exp oh, well, this is a temperature profile, but let's say here, the decay length of this density profile, how this changes as a function of diverter conditions. So this is plotted here, this is the decay length for L mode plasmas uh, in a six upgrade as a function of the diverter collisionality. And the diverter collisionality is something like a product of, or a quotient of density divided by temperature. So the lower the dense, the lower the temperature is, the higher the collisionality will be. You know, this just means, I told you plasmas collide less and less the hotter they are, and they collide more and more the colder they are. And you can see here, there's a big break here, where a sh what we call a shoulder form. So this profile suddenly gets relatively flat. And so you could assume that probably in this area here, suddenly transport increases very strongly, even though you may not have a direct proof of it. And then we run the code with all these drifts active that push the particles around here. And we tried to understand a phenomenon on a six upgrade that for years less, less left us clueless what the reason for this could be which is what we labeled the high field side high density. So this is an area where the electron density measured with this stark broadening technique that I explained to you last week, you remember the broadening of the profile, which depends on the uh, density. And we observed the phenomenon that this density, high density region, uh, as a function of, for example, heating power, started to spread from here up, 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 up here. And even these pressure gauges that are located here suddenly saw the neutral pressures that were comparable to the neutral pressures here. For us, it was impossible to understand what, how this could be. Yeah? And it took us a long time to understand this. And it turned out it's a combination of the assumption that we made on our perpendicular transport. So the fact that here suddenly the transport increases very strongly, especially in the fast strip of layer, and having to run with drifts at the same time. By combining these two effects and assumptions, we were suddenly able to uh, model what the maximum density here in the fast strip of layer is as a function of the heating power and thereby roughly recover the um, experimental observations qualitatively. Yeah, these curves look very similar. So at least we knew, okay, a big effect, which is the effect by heating power, that this heating power increases the extension of this high field side high density, we were able to capture uh, in the model. This was a decisive breakthrough for us. And so um, we also could show that by doing our assumptions that with increased fueling, so this means more and more gas into the system, we could, um, when we active the drift terms, you can see here that without drifts, this region of high density does spread out, but not at the same magnitude as it does with the, with the drifts. Yeah. And this was something that was captured also in the model. And here now uh, this, colorful plot here with all these lines of sight is something where we compare. So now you can also in the numerical models, you can introduce like virtual diagnostic. 
So this dark broadening effect that I showed you, I remember here from time ago, is the width of the profile. Where is it? it takes a while, very far back. This one here. So if you have a certain electron density, yeah, the delta epsilon line of a Balma line will be broadened, let's say like this, at a density of 3.4 times 10 to the 20. Now in the numerical simulation, you can say, okay, let us put this line of sight into the numerical simulation. We know what the electron density is along this line from the code. Yeah? And we can compute what the line broadening is based on our simulated profile and say, what would the electron density be that a virtual spectrometer would measure based on the line broadening integrated over the computational line of sight? Yeah? So we do the same and, and then we can compare the two data. So the one that we recover from the experiment doing the same assumption. And in the model, we do the same assumption that the spectroscopist does. Yeah? so that we have a more direct comparison. So there's less of an interpretation in there. And this is with which I will stop before the break because I'll show you that. Uh, so here, every line of sight that is green is a match with the volumetric information from the actual spectrometers at less than 5% difference. Yeah? So you can see that for wide areas of the computational domain in the diverter where we have no other diagnostics other than spectroscopy, which is very sensitive to changes in temperatures and density, we have a fairly good agreement between the model and the experiment. However, there are still some areas, so uh, red lines of sight, where our density is overpredicted, and blue lines of sight, where we underpredict. So this means that despite us modeling this high field solar density, apparently we do not capture all of its poloidal extent, because in the, in the far area here, we underpredict it. Okay? And with this, I'll stop for a 10-minute break. Let's say... Yeah, 35 or so. Yeah. If there are any questions, you can ask me after the break. You can think about it. Okay. Uh, how would the minimum flow is measured? How it is measured in the experiment? Well, in the scrap of layer, one attempt to do so is to measure the fluctuations of the electric potential and of the density of the plasma. And from this, making some assumptions on the nature of the perpendicular flow, you can derive what the perpendicular flow would be. But an assumption comes in that the temperature is not fluctuating, the electron temperature and the ion temperature. Now, the electron temperature fluctuation, one may even be able to measure, and this has been done, and can be taken into account. But for the ion temperature, it's, it's already very difficult to measure the ion temperature as such in the scrap of air. The, uh, there are some diagnostics that believe they can do it. It's unclear how good these data are, and then, one of the main diagnostics is charge exchange. But charge exchange, you need a high, higher ion temperature because you look at the shift of the line, of the center of the line, due to the Doppler shift, due to the temperature of the ion. And so if the temperature of the ion is very low, this Doppler shift is very small, and you hardly can distinguish it from the main line. Plus, where the density is low, the signal strength is low, which you are, and in the script of here, you're double punished. The temperature is low and the density is low. So the charge exchange measurements usually end around the supratrix, maybe one or two points further. So um, this is one of the reasons why the people that aim at measuring the perpendicular particle flux are not so confident to say, okay, we know exactly what the perpendicular flux is. They have indications that with increasing density, for example, 
the fluctuation levels go up. So they have done a lot of statistical analysis. Everything points to the particle flux increasing with density. Yeah? But when I ask them, give me a number, they will not do it because they say, well, our information is not sufficiently complete to do this. But it's, yeah, let's say, okay, it, it's done essentially with a Langmuir probe often that sits on a long arm. We call this a mid-plane manipulator. And there's a little head with set of Langmuir probes. And it's uh, inserted into the plasma in a very short time period. Usually we call this a plunge. And this plunge lasts about 300 milliseconds. And then it's extracted and you do several plunges during a discharge. And you can't do long plunges because the heat flux is so high close to the subtratrix that otherwise you would evaporate your pins that are trying to measure it. And as you erode your pins, you change the surface area over which you would um, attract your particles that you want to measure and you change over time your, the quality of your measurement. And so they have to be fast, can measure some samples. And nowadays they do it, maybe they do even five plunges per discharge. But in H mode, they can't reach the subratrix really because the heat flux is too high because the, the power fall of length is even steeper. And so this is why many of these measurements have been in H1. Nowadays, we have a new diagnostic uh, that is a helium beam. And I explained to you earlier the lithium beam. And the helium beam works similar to the lithium beam, but has the further advantage that you can also measure the temperature. And so with the helium beam, you can measure density and temperature fluctuations because you can measure at very high sampling rates. So more than 100,000 measurements per second, which gives you a time resolution of the order of 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five seconds. And this way you can measure actually the fluctuations. And this is now becoming more and more uh, um, yeah, working horse for doing such fluctuation measurements at least, even though this may not yet tell you what the flux is, but at least you can see how the turbulent fluctuations are from which you may then understand what the flux is. But also this doesn't work at very high densities because then the beam is absorbed and you don't see anything in there. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is the wrong one. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, glorious success here. Furthermore, um, I told you, I, I, I talked to you about uh, different degrees of detachment. There was a curve where you could see the heat flux upstream, like an exponential decay. And then under attached conditions, uh, the target heat flux was very similar. And the more detached it was, the more you would lose uh, heat flux close to the separatrix. And I also told you when I said about, let's say, how risk, which, which is the best diagnostic to compare, which is more sensitive. I told you that modeling the iron flux to the target is very sensitive to the upstream condition and it's something very difficult to achieve. So um, what uh, he succeeded in was, you can see here, um, Let's look at this lower plot here. So this is the particle flux at the target for the uh, inner target, which you barely see which, because it's down here yeah? and for the outer target. And what you can see is that the SOLPS simulation, so SOLPS is this numerical code for the outer target. So the blue line and this sand or orange colored line, they agree quite well with these uh, experimental data when the outer target is attached. Yeah? And when the outer target is strongly detached, I told you there's a bit of a debate if one should call it complete or pronounced detachment. You can see that even under these conditions, so for the inner target now, you hardly see any experimental data, so it's hard to compare to anything. <clears throat> but for the outer target, you can see that 
the pelvic flux is also well matched. And you can see also that first of all, we've matched the particle flux. And secondly, the peak particle flux between the attached conditions and the detached conditions has been reduced by one order of magnitude. Now you remember that the particle flux was proportional to the pressure at the target divided by the square root of the temperature. This was from the first lecture. And I can tell you the target temperature is very low. Yeah. So um, without showing it to you here. Yeah. So this means that the plasma pressure has been reduced. And this is something you can see here in the top plot, top plot. So in attached conditions, you have here, let's say peak pressure is around 600 six, uh, Pascal, plasma pressure. And here it's an order of magnitude less. Yeah? So the code has been able to match the experimental data and also um, uh, match the, the uh, evolution of the pressure. So while this is not a smoking gun, let's say, because <laughs> the problem with these numerical codes, you can't, by, by having an agreement between model and experimental data, you cannot mathematically prove that the model is correct. It's impossible. But you have a strong indication that all the physics components that are of relevance seem to be included in the model. Yeah? This is also true for some climate forecast. Yeah? There's no proof that the model is correct, but there's a strong indication that the models are relatively complete. Yeah? So for us, <clears throat> this meant that we have from here on started to become quite confident that actually the numerical codes that we use are of good quality. Yeah, that we can actually use them to interpret the experimental data. Because this was done for H mode and strongly radiating regime. So this complete detachment has a dissipation of more than 80%. You remember I told you that you need high dissipation to reach this complete detachment. And we were able to model this x radiator. What comes further <clears throat> is you remember I told you about these uh, um, ionization manometers that we have on a six upgrade. And the neutral pressure <clears throat> is something which is, uh, has been very, very difficult to model um, in the numerical codes. And it's something that often is not modeled because it's too difficult to achieve. And in fact, in H mode, so when we compared this pressure gauge here, so in L mode, when I was a postdoc and tried to do these things on a six upgrade, for this neutral pressure, we had a factor three to five off from what we measured in the experiment um, <clears throat> at high densities. So those densities that are relevant for observing the detachment. This was a major discrepancy. And in H mode, if we didn't include this additional transport that I talked to you in the fast scribble layer that we observed also in the experiment to some extent, or at least its potential effect, and did not include um, activated drift terms. The difference that we would have here for this pressure, <clears throat> so the ratio of experimentally measured pressure to model pressure would be a factor 10, roughly. Yeah? So this means, for example, that the throughput of particles, so how much we inject in the experiment compared to how much we inject in the model, would be off by one order of magnitude. Yeah, so the confidence in if we would do this right for a future device or a different device was very low. However, here you can see that for most pressure gauges, other than the one here in the back, we are roughly matching the experimental data because the ratio between the experimental and the model one is <coughs> roughly one. What is left is uh, a too small of a difference, because it's very sensitive, too small of a difference to, to really take it too seriously as a problem. However, the fast scraper player you see here, so this area here, there's still a factor two to two and a half difference. Yeah. And I also showed you in the spectroscopy 
that there were some lines of sight up in the inner diverter that were blue where we were underestimating. So it's consistent that our high field side density that we were modeling is on the right track, but we haven't modeled its full extension. Yeah? And one can debate if it was worth or would be worth to go even further. We decided that this is okay for us. Yeah? So we, we decided we don't need to go further. So um, why was this venture here so important? Because once we modeled the correct recycling and neutral pressure, yeah, we also could see, so what we did here at some point is that we didn't fix the supratrix density as we did in the past, but we really injected the particle flux that we saw in the experiment because if this uh, pressure gauge down here, so F07, is the same as in the experiment, then this means that probably we are also catching correctly the neutral conductance here in the diverter. It's pumped in the right way. And so we are regulating the separatrix density purely by the power we inject into the simulation, which is similar or comparable to what we have in the experiment and the gas puff that we inject in the experiment as well as in the modeling. Yeah. So uh, this means that the profiles, the profile shape is adapting to all our particle fluxes. And what comes in here is that because we have the right um, model apparently to emulate this high field side density, if we have a high density here, then, um, and the density here is higher than in the core, yeah, because we have here in the inner diverter scraper layer, we have densities of 10 to the 20, several 10 to the 20 per cubic meter, while inside the last closed flux surface, so I don't think you can see my mouse right now, there it is. Um, inside here, it's one order of magnitude less roughly. Yeah? So you expect to have particle diffusion. And what one observed always is when there is a high field high density, the confinement of the plasma went down. Yeah? And when the high field side density is removed, for example, by seeding of nitrogen, this would remove the high field side density. I haven't shown this to you. The confinement was improving. And it was hard to understand why this was the case. But these simulations were able to provide a hint because what we saw in the simulations is that the density profile moved yeah, radially, let's say, or if you want, you could also translate that the separatrix density, the value changed. So the separatrix density changed a very tiny bit and um, this provided input to those people that look at the density and pressure profiles inside the last closed flux surface, because this pressure profile inside the last closed flux surface has a strong impact on the confinement. So on the energy confinement, how good the plasma is confined overall. And you can see here that if they assumed an inward or outward shift of the profiles that were consistent with our uh, interpretation from the, from the modeling related to this high field side density, then they were also able to understand better what the confinement was. And so here, all of it closes back together and we ended up with a very consistent picture of understanding how the diverter conditions are, how these impact the high field side density, how the radiation pattern was and how this would ultimately impact the confinement. So finally, we had a relatively good understanding and these interpretive uh, simulations and the fact that they got closer to the experiment, even not perfect, but close enough, was a major improvement. So then there has been also some work for alternative diverter configurations. So do we understand these? And, <clears throat> um, and uh, so there have been uh, numerical modeling of a single null and a snowflake configuration for TCD and an, a, a cloud of impurity radiation between the two null points here. 
Yeah? So these are the two null points of the uh, snowflake was observed in the numerical modeling, which then also in, uh, you can see it's not the identical configuration, but at least qualitatively, also then later in the experiment, such a radiation was observed. And this is the reason why people are nowadays a bit interested in the snowflake, because you remember I told you that for geometrical reasons, the power flux to the two targets would be reduced. Yeah. But furthermore, it seems it might be possible to sustain, where's my mouse again? It might be possible to sustain radiation between the two X spots. The advantage is that you wouldn't need to radiate inside the core. And so you would reduce the risk of contaminating the core with impurities and thereby reducing confinement. If you could increase the radiation in this uh, region of between the two X points, knowing that the radiation in the scrape of layer has some maximum value that you can achieve, which is something I discussed last time. So I will skip this and I'll skip this part here. Okay. So um, we also, as you know, we, I, I explained to you that on our six upgrade, we are modifying the upper diverter. And so we wanted to know what happens if we have a snowflake, um, what would be the power load onto the target and how would drifts affect uh, the power sharing between the targets. And what we saw <coughs> is that, um, uh, <coughs> that we were finally able to model a snowflake with activated drift terms yeah, for us six upgrade for the predict. Of course, we have nothing to compare because we don't have data yet. And this diverter will only come into operation in 2023. Yeah. So, uh, but we were able to see how the uh, drifts, oops, uh, how the drifts would impact the uh, sharing of the power to the targets. So <clears throat> this is uh, outer target one, and here you have outer target uh, two and three. And you can see in the case without drifts, you have this dashed lines. Unfortunately, we didn't label it. And you can see that if drifts are activated, you get to this colored lines and the outer target three that would receive less power starts to receive more power. So drifts might help to share the power across the targets and therefore actually increase the hope that maybe such a snowflake divert at least from a plasma physics perspective could be of a great potential benefit. However, there are strong engineering constraints for this that relate especially to the vertical stability of these snowflake configurations that may be able to be handled in current devices. But when you project what currents you need to control the vertical displacement yeah, of the plasma, then it may be that on a demo scale reactor, a snowflake is just not possible from an engineering perspective. And so, <clears throat> but currently there's a strong debate and there are some investigations into which also the group of uh, Giuseppe is involved in order to analyze uh, what the engineering restrictions are and if such a path is absolutely impossible or to some degree feasible. Yeah? So uh, in the next two to three years, we hope to find two answers. One is that the physicists say, yes, the snowflake minus really has a strong such a strong potential that the engineering risks are worth taking, or it's worth to invest more time in the engineering to find maybe a different solution. But on the other hand, if the physicists can't say that the snowflake has a huge potential for dissipating more power, then it's likely that this is a path that will not be pursued on the engineering side in the future, because if the gain is small and the risk for the machine is too high, 
then this is not a solution for a machine. Yeah. So um, there are a few lessons we learned from applying numerical codes to the experimental data that gave us insight into what are the important physics that we would have only guessed looking at experimental data. And one of the most important uh, lessons learned, at least for um, diverters with vertical target system, was that just looking at one of the two targets, as was done in the past, is insufficient. We were only able to match the outer target conditions in the uh, between the experiment and the model, or the model and the experiment, to be fair, only once we were able to model the inner diverter conditions, especially this high field side density. So we knew that there is a strong con connection between the physics in the inner diverter and the physics in the outer diverter. And this connection was done by two elements. One was the drifts that connect the particle transport between the two targets that I explained to you here in this earlier video. Let me sh just show you the graphical concept. Let's, let's stick to this one. So by including all these drifts, but especially these flows here. So this one, the green one, this red one, and the green one. Yeah, only by having these processes active in the diverter was it possible to um, to match both targets at the same time and by making making better assumptions on the perpendicular transport so uh, then by <clears throat> then a key lesson is that the perpendicular transport especially in the fast scraper layer seems to have a strong impact on the diverter solution, which is something we had never looked at before. But because the experimental evidence and your question on what is the perpendicular particle flux is so strong that we need to take this into account. One may not have expected how strong the impact would be, but we have understood the impact on the diverter solution can be very large. We do not know if it will be playing a role in a machine like ETA or DEMO and what its impact will be on the diverter solution. So this is another thing that will be looked in, on the, in, the, in the future. But um, um, another important result was that the particle throughput through the whole system, we can now match uh, and understand the order of magnitude of the experimentally used throughput of particles. Okay, um, impurity transport and how the impurity is distributed in the diverter is still an open issue. And one of the reasons why this is an open issue is because in order to, dis to simulate the right distribution of impurities, again, you need to active drift terms. Drift terms are time consuming in a numerical way. And you also need the right um, spectroscopic interpretation. So we now have methods developed in the last years that can tell us from spectroscopy what the concentration of nitrogen is in the diverter, what the concentration of neon is in the diverter. But for argon, this is still work under development that spectroscopists are working on to uh, provide such an information. Okay, now once you have done all this validation thing, you can also think, okay, I could also use the codes to do some numerical experiments. So if, what if, when scenarios, yeah? So why not use such a code? If I believe that the code contains most of the elements, why not look at what could happen under certain conditions? So we, we call these, let's say, numerical experiments or numerical thought experiments, which allow you to understand better how sensitive certain solutions may be to certain processes. And there are two things. One was mixed impurity seeding. So you remember the impurities, they radiate in different temperature ranges. So some impurities um, radiate at colder temperatures, other impurities radiate at higher temperatures. One of the questions was, if we combine two, two impurities, 
can we increase the overall amount of power dissipated? So is one plus one larger than two yeah, in terms of radiation? Or does it at the end of the day not matter if I use impurity A or impurity B? Yeah? And it turns out <coughs> that, um, as I said, the impurity rates is at different temperatures. What turned out was that the maximum radiative dissipation that was achievable overall was independent of the impurity that we see that in the numerical experiment for the machines that we have. And this seemed to be consistent with the experimental observations that we also did on the devices. We could reach similar radiative fractions independent of the impurity that we injected until a point where the overall plasma stability broke down and the machine or the plasma disrupted <clears throat> that may be connected to other effects than the pure radiation physics as such, but more to instabilities triggered that these models do not take into account. But from a pure, let's say, dissipative physics that I've explained to you in this lecture, it turns out that you can reach the same dissipative fraction independent of the impurity that you inject. But what changes is where the impurity radiates. And this then changes how good the confinement of the plasma is at high radiative levels. And the reason for this is because the impurities radiate different in different areas of the temperature range. So <clears throat> um, if we look at the, so the pedestal, I never try, I try to avoid to have to explain what the pedestal is. But the pedestal is, let's say, um, you remember, so the, you have a radial upstream profile for the temperature. Yeah. It extends into the scraper layer, but it also goes into the region inside the last closed flux surface. And then at some point, this, the, this temperature gradient doesn't go up to infinity, but at some point, there's a break and the gradient of the temperature flattens. And this, this area where this break is, or this change in curvature, is uh, the top of the pedestal. Yeah? And we're so interested in this. Actually, I can show you a picture. So, yeah, OK, here it's just the pressure. But the top of the pedestal is this area here where this pressure profile changes. So when I talk about pedestal, we're talking about this area here. And we call this a pedestal because it's like for a column, like a Greek column that sits on a pedestal. The, the core of the plasma sits on this pedestal. And so uh, if the gradient of the core is always the same, then how high this gradient can go only depends on the edge and therefore on the pedestal. Yeah. And so the pedestal determines is, is, a, is a strong factor in determining the overall confinement, <clears throat> which is what I hinted here when I talked to you about the impact of the scrape of layer conditions on the confinement. Okay, so, but, oops. But if the temperature uh, at the pedestal drops, this means that the confinement or that there's a higher likelihood that the confinement is being deteriorated. And so you can see between nitrogen, which is the cyan colors, and argon, there's a major difference. That nitrogen impacts the pedestal top temperature, at least for acid subprint conditions, less than argon. So when you see the argon, you may reach the same overall radiation, but the impact on confinement will be larger under these discharge conditions. Yeah. Because the loss of pedestal top temperature is larger. And then you see here, there are some crosses that uh, have a varying mixed um, proportion between nitrogen and argon. We try to mix the two to see if maybe the mix would overall optimize the total dissipation. And this was not the case, but a higher fraction of argon in the mix uh, would deteriorate the 
pedestal top temperature under these purely radiative and transport conditions that we assume here, um, in the same way as uh, argon seeding would do. And you can see here how the uh, pedestal top is reduced when you go to 100% argon compared to what you do at 100% nitrogen. Yeah. So this is a reduction of more than 10%, which is considerable, which could have a considerable impact on confinement. So uh, on the other hand, potentially a benefit of seeding argon because it affects the, this pedestal area could be that it makes the gradients of these pedestals flatter and the pedestals wider. And this could, but we do not know, have a beneficial effect on these elms. So triggering smaller elms or even maybe avoiding elms because elms are these periodic outbursts of high energy and particle contents. And if you can make these outbursts smaller, so reduce the amount of particles and energy that you expel, then maybe part of the scrape of layer is able to cope with this. And so you don't get such large heat loads onto the diverter target per square meter and time. Yeah. Also because the heat load on the target by each of these outbursts, these elms, depends is strongly correlated with the pedestal pressure that you have. So the smaller the pressure is, the smaller the heat load of the end per square meter. Then the other one <clears throat> item that we did is, well, this was a master thesis that we had. And so we wanted to see what the connection was between strip of the transport. So the one that we have a hard time measuring and this formation of the shoulder. You remember I showed you this picture where the function of the diverter collisionality, suddenly the shoulder would form. And we wanted to see if by increasing the transport in the simulation, we could emulate such an effect. And this is what we did. And you can see here uh, a low plasma density profile that we fit. So this is a SOPS simulation and the data, it's the same data I showed you earlier, just now different colors. And added here is the green dashed line that is the, um, the fitted diffusion coefficient that the simulation fitted automatically by all these assumptions that I explained to you earlier, this iterative process. And you can see the diffusion coefficient is of the order of one to two in this grip of layer. Yeah? So on the right side, you see the scale for the diffusion coefficient. And on the right plot on this graph here, this is a case at high density also based on experimental data. And you can see here the experimental data. While on the left side, you see this nice exponentially decaying curve. On the right side, you see first an exponential decay. And then this area here that we call a shoulder, where there's no further experimental decay. The density just stays high until it reaches a far scrape of layer, where then it starts to decrease again. And we could model this by assuming a very high diffusion coefficient in this area of the shoulder, which is clear. Yeah, I mean, if you assume the transport is, um, is proportional to the gradient and you have a very flat gradient, then in order to have a high transport, your diffusion coefficient needs to go up. So it is sort of expected. But the interesting part of this analysis was that the values of the diffusion coefficient that came out of this simulation were similar to what one would expect as a diffusion value if one made an assumption. So one measures this turbulent transport. And if one assumes that the transport flux this would be of a certain value, one can make an, an assumption of, uh, so um, when you have this turbulent transport, the turbulent transport is like, like small blobs moving through the, through the plasma. It's like bursts of plasma, small bursts of plasma, one after the other moving radially outwards. 
and one can look at this blobby nature of the transport of the plasma. And then one can, by let's say correlation analysis, uh, derive what the diffusion coefficient would need to be in order to uh, explain in a quantitative way this train of blobby transport across the strip of layer. And if one does this, then one derives a diffusion coefficient. And it happened to be that this diffusion coefficient was similar to what a transport code that doesn't know anything about turbulence would need to describe a similar order of magnitude of transport that triggers this shoulder formation. So for us, this made us quite confident that this type of description, because it was consistent with other mathematical, let's say, simplification theories, um, would have made us expect to provide. So um, if we assume um, <clears throat> higher um, perpendicular transport, then the result was that the, um, the, the power entering the diverter is lowered, the target loads are flattened, and the volumetric dissipation here of uh, energy is, um, uh, well, you remove a lot of energy even in the region close to the subtractions. And uh, if one looks at what the different um, energy sources are or sinks are, then using such a numerical code, you can you can um, analyze what the in, what the contribution of the individual processes is that leads to this dissipation of power. And don't forget, these were simulations of pure deuterium, no impurities, so no additional radiation. And what one finds out, forget about, no, don't concentrate on this blue or brown curves, just look at this green curve and you can see that plasma neutral interaction. So this is essentially charge exchange started to play a big role once one had this additional transport. And this was a numerical exercise to see, okay, first of all, can we model this shoulder formation? Yes, we could. And once we have this shoulder formation, that is triggered by additional perpendicular transport or by enhanced perpendicular transport. You can see the transport we need to assume between this high transport case and the low transport case is very different. Yeah, we're talking about one order of magnitude higher diffusion coefficient, which means a lot more transport. And by having this more transport, we were able to um, trigger detachment through transport. So low density, this is the particle flux, parallel particle flux to the target. So low density is an attached case. Yeah? So no pressure loss to the target roughly. This uh, violet curve here, it's my mouse again. This violet curve here is now a high density case where in the experiment we observe detachment, but these simulations show you that the particle flux is similar and therefore no detachment to be expected in the simulation, even though in the experiments we would see detachment. So while we didn't make a quantitative comparison between the simulated and the experimental data, we could show that when you assume a higher perpendicular transport, this higher perpendicular transport would trigger a whole uh, concatenation of effects that would lead to detachment because the parallel particle, as you can see here, was reduced by a factor two. Yeah. And these dashed lines that you see here, this is something we did on top of it, reflect the uncertainty in the upstream um, uh, profiles that we had from the experiment. So after this, we slowly uh, come to an end. So. I've explained to you at the beginning the, the concept, then I've introduced some simple models that can describe this, like the two-point model. Then we went to the very complex numerical codes. Then I showed you that we have applied these codes to um, verify the codes to see if they qualitatively and quantitatively uh, 
are able to explain current experimental uh, simulation, uh, current experimental data. And furthermore, I've told you that these numerical codes take ages to come up with a solution if all of the physics, especially the drift terms, are included in the code. So if we need to say what how does a big machine what is a big machine supposed to look like yeah? the question is can we if we believe them the models compare well to the experimental data can we extract from these uh, numerical codes some simplified models that we can then use to quickly extrapolate to a large device and that we can maybe use even in so-called system codes, codes that bring in a lot more of information, like engineering constraints on the coil size, on the number of coils that you can fit in the toroidal direction, on the full, I don't know, electrical output simulation of this machine, a code that tells you should the machine have a radius of five meters, seven meters, nine meters, yeah, what what's this machine to look like? So. In these system codes, a lot of simplified assumptions go in. Question is, can the, uh, I told you that the dissipation, dissipated physics, diverter physics is one of these four, let's say areas of critical risk for the next step device. One was the breeding blankets, one was the remote handling, diverter solution was one of them. So can we try to um, inform these system codes on what the, um, how the power exhaust behaves under the, the, the conditions that they assume? And so this is a question of simplified and scaling models. So one is here, publication by Arne Kallenbach that was shown at the Fusion Energy Conference by the IEA uh, nearly 10 years ago. So what he did is he took uh, under conditions up to the detachment threshold, so up to when the uh, plasma would detach due to impurity seeding. He took data from CMOG, which is a metallic machine, so a machine with metallic plasma facing components, R6 upgrade and jet of nitrogen seeded discharges and looked at how the radiation scaled and fit the experimental data point to an, um, a multi-parameter fitting scale as a function of the neutral pressure, the Z effective, so this is the impurity content, let's say, the major radius, the heat decay length. Yeah? And he found out that this type of fit would scale, would, would fit well the experimental data from deep three devices of different size. So you could argue, well, such a scaling law for the impurity radiation of nitrogen could be a way to scale how much radiation we would expect in a future device. Yeah? Could be used for this. And the question was, if we apply the same scaling in the numerical simulations that we have, would we also fit our expected radiation fractions? So we did this for JET and R6 upgrade. And you can see that uh, for JET over a large um, uh, variance of injection rate of nitrogen, this fits fairly well the total radiative fraction that we uh, simulate. We can use the same fit that Arne Kallenbach used for experimental data to fit the radiation evolution for simulated data. Yeah? The only difference is the assumption we needed to make on the heat flux because he did it in H mode and we did the simulations in L mode. And so we needed to change the um, scaling length by factor two, which is roughly what is the difference in the scaling width between H and N. So this shows that, yes, such scalings, so we could use these numerical simulations also to, to 
derive similar gradative scalings, which then could be used to extrapolate to a future device. Of course, it only allows you to identify the operational space, but it doesn't tell you what the detail value is. You always need to run a complete simulation then at the end to, to, to let's say, have more information. Yeah. And then <clears throat> one could use also, for example, one could check if maybe reduced physics models also play the game. And so a comparison was done by our Polish and Finnish colleagues between this highly sophisticated SOPS simulation and the simulations done with CoreDiv, which is a very reduced model for uh, simulating the scraper player. For example, it doesn't contain any kinetic information of the neutrals, and it doesn't contain the actual magnetic equilibrium of the uh, Plasma, it's just a slab geometry. And interestingly, if you start here with the right figure, you could see that SOPS and CORDIV produce a, a long, so this normalized length is, let's say, the distance between the upstream and the target position, produces a similar evolution of the uh, nitrogen radiation or nitrogen radiation, yes. But as you can see here on the left, based on very different density and temperature profiles. Yeah? So if you would look only at the total radiation, then you would say, okay, I could, instead of using this very difficult SOPS code, I could use just the simplified core diff code. It would provide for me the same or very similar information on the radiation from nitrogen. But the reason why it does so is very different because the profiles that it simulates so well, the temp temperature and the density are very different between the two curves. And the black curves I've shown you earlier, that they compared well with the experimental data. Yeah? And so this means you need to be very cautious when using reduced models to simulate a system. So maybe the radiation works, but you shouldn't overstress the, the, the application of such a code to the problem. Okay, I think I come with this to the end. I won't go through all the bullet points here. Maybe just stopping at the first one, which is the most important one. So the big unknown in all this diverter physics that I've explained to you the last three lectures, is our understanding on the nature of perpendicular transport. And this is why a lot of effort also on the national labs, but also on the European level, is currently invested in developing numerical codes over the next years that should improve our understanding and the description of the nature of the perpendicular transport in the scraper layer and in the pedestal region. So the region that is just inside the last closed flux surface, because this is where in these transport codes, we are completely blind without experimental data to which we just do a fit of the transport coefficients. We have no predictive power to model a large scale device without reasonable assumptions on the perpendicular transport. So it seems we contain all the other physics that's relevant other than this one decisive element. Okay. So are there any questions after all this? I can't see any hand raised. <clears throat> Either I've killed you again. So Dominic, you have a question. Please. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so you, you, you insisted about the, the importance of um, perpendicular transport. And uh, obviously, you made uh, large progress uh, in order to understand it uh, with the experiments performed uh, on the on as Dexter Brigade. OK, uh, but then uh, from this, how can you uh, 
can you bridge the gap uh, toward uh, ITER and DEMO? Well, um, we are a little bit blind here. So we can only bridge the gap by making some assumptions on what the profiles upstream, for example, we expect to look like in a machine like ETA and DEMO. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the only information we have at the moment is what one may expect what the decay length of the heat flux is on a machine like ETA and DEMO based on the scalings that have been derived under attached conditions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have absolutely no uh, further information on this. And this is why it is so important when simulations are done for large devices to make a, a, a variation in some of the parameters, especially those that relate to transport. For example, you may or may not know that based on turbulence models, there is the CG1 code from CS Chen in the US, Mm -hmm. Actually, instead of a decay length of the order of one millimeter for ether, predicts a decay length of five millimeters for the heat flux. Yes, I, yes, I know this result. Yeah. And so, obviously, the simulations need to play with this parameter to see how sensitive would be the solution be to uh, such a change in parameters. But this is all that can be done at the moment until the codes that provide some information on turbulence are uh, matured. So for example, uh, at uh, University de, de Marseille, there, are, there is quite some progress being done on using a method called the K-Epsilon method, which at least under mm -hmm. attached conditions can inform these uh, fluid transport codes on the on some of the nature of the perpendicular mm. uh, uh, flux under the mm. conditions that these transport codes self consistently mm. um, uh, evolve. The problem is that the perpendicular transport, um, I showed you that these, these codes make an assumption that this is a linear combination of some diffusive and convective transport. So, uh, but the problem is that this linear equation is only valid for any one single data point. So mm -hmm. it is not like a, like a parameterized function. So you can't make a plot where on one axis you put the gradient and the other one you put the density, then you get a line, yeah, which mm -hmm. would be the implication of such an equation. Mm -hmm. This is not true. So it's, it's, this equation is just a description, a parameterized description, but not really a function that has any physical meaning. And so uh -huh. it's not possible to, um, to have some sort of a, a, a scaling function for the perpendicular transport. Uh -huh. and, and this is a problem. Uh, okay, I see. Okay, thank you for your uh, very precise uh, answer. And uh, thank you very much for, for your course. Uh, I'm a newcomer in the field. And thanks to you, uh, I'm getting uh, the broad picture of the story uh, in a very pedagogical way. Thank you very much. Thank you, I try. <laughs> Are there any further questions? I hear any further questions? Either everything is, I mean, you can always contact me by email. I guess the email is available somewhere in the announcement of the lecture. Uh, if you have settled, um, in the future, I'll try to modify the lecture further to make it more easily digestible in some parts, but this is an evolutionary process and I can only do this or improve on this if I get questions from your side where I see where you may have for sure not understood anything or where a topic has been too difficult to approach. I've tried to break this down a little bit and simplify things and, and try to work with the analogies, but I need your feedback to, to know where you may have not understood very well stuff or where maybe I absolutely didn't explain things for a normal 
other module <laughs> than a specialist on derivative physics to understand something. Yeah, so um, I think I mean, now it, now it has also been very dense because you have one day, next day, next day, so you can't really digest. So if we would have done the lecture, let's say one week, next week, next week, then already after one week, you may have forgotten part of it. And then maybe I notice what you have forgotten. Yeah, Like this, you get a lot of information in a very short time, which is uh, hard to digest. Shall I stop the registration here? Yeah. So I can... Uh...